in that I'm talking about Spokio, which is a Ruby library that I wrote. Um, I consume a lot of web APIs in my job. And code that we tend to see people write to consume web APIs is not a lot of fun to work with. Um, it's usually a mess of boilerplate code that uh, deals with uh, checking content types and response codes and other uh, really repetitive details. Um, most of the time, though, planning implementations don't actually check things and just break it exactly whenever something unexpected comes in. So, Spokio abstracts away all of the boilerplate HTTP code and presents a resource based API document. Um, most of the web services that we interact with in this industry uh, at least claim to be restful. Um, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with the concepts and terminology I'm using. Is uh, REST a region most people are familiar with? Um, of course, the day. So most services claim to be restful, some of them are lying, but um, it's at least the, uh, the idea is there. Uh, and resources are a really central concept of REST, but a lot of the client code that you see doesn't know what a resource is, doesn't deal with resources, and just makes low level HTTP calls and uh, deals with things like paths and HTTP methods, and the abstraction of resources isn't really there. Um, there are some implementations that do, uh, like active resources, a significant one that you would probably do if you use Rails. Um, but I figured that could do it better. And the way to do it better is with OpenAPI. Um, how many people know OpenAPI? Have you ever heard of it? OpenAPI people? Okay, that's about what I figured. Um, so OpenAPI is a specification that describes basically every aspect of a web service, a web API. Yeah. Um, it's a machine readable document uh, expressed in JSON or YAML, and it's language agnostic, so there's a lot of existing tooling across a number of languages, which gives you generated documentation, it does validation of requests in a number of different ways. There's a really good to work with those request responses. Uh, but there hasn't been much on Ruby. There are a few libraries, but Scorpio is, as far as I know, the only thing like it. Um, so this presentation isn't about API, but I'm going to explain a bit of it briefly because it's very much Scorpio's built around with API. Um, so we're going to dive into an example, which is the pet store. Uh, anyone who has started to know API has probably seen this. It's kind of a novel example that the project uses to illustrate what you can do. Um, and this is a documentation uh, generator which takes the square pet store. That was the former name of the open API. And I'm going to talk about two parts of open API to start with. The tabs are the top. So this has three tabs. There's the pet tag, which has the written by the pets, the store, which deals with orders, and the user, which is basically a um, login user resource. I'm going to ask through these because I'm only going to focus on one. Um, uh, so the pet store, the pet rather, the top. So tab like pet 
basically represents a collection of operations, which is the other part of OpenAPI that is kind of the core um, piece. And the pet tag has a number of operations, mostly in the front operations. Um, you post slash pet to create a pet, update is put slash pet. There's a few ways to read. You can get by status, by pet ID. Um, and there's the link, which is So these are the kind of fundamentals of how the OpenAPI uh, expresses this. The YAML specification that I mentioned, the machine readable document is on the left, and this rendering is on the right for visualization. Changed ownership to the Open API um, initiative and is now called Open API. Swagger remains, but it's just the tooling. So this editor.swagger.by website is uh, probably the most commonly used documentation generator, and they have a bunch of other cool tooling as well. It's not in Ruby, but it's still a really cool ecosystem with a lot of good stuff already in it that's very useful. So the next slides are going to demonstrate how you configure the full API client for this service. Um, well, not full. I'm going to focus on pets, but the concepts are very easy to extend to the rest of the API. Um, we're going to start with a class. So I'm going to jump into a console. Here's an awesome you want to pry our Scorpio, my library, and in order to get my windows Inherits from Scorpio's resource based class, which you may not be able to place in there, but it's at the moment. And Scorpio's resource based class contains all of Scorpio's knowledge of um, what a resource is and how it uh, corresponds to a thing I document. <coughs> So the best store resource class there will um, represent all of the resources of the API client of the API that we're building the client for. Um, the main thing that we want to do with this is tell it where that open API document is. That's actually in the wrong place, but in a console. So I'm going to get the open API document from sr.swagger.io, which is where I just saw the documentation. Load that URL, uh, press this JSON, and set that as the last of the API document. And it's not what I'm suspecting. So it was like five times the practice runs that I did. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot 
treated you better, any better. Well prepared. Uh, 
the Swatch data set up as well as with the operators. So they're all pretty similar. But we're going to take one of these at random. So we'll pass that sample to pick one random, which is going to be a pet named Hello Kitty. Every time I run this, it's different because it's the live API that a lot of people test against. So, uh, in this case, we have Hello Kitty, which is status already sold. Tags. Uh, one tag to Paul, I think. The tag's not playing, I think. This book tag is playing. So there's kind of a lot wrapped up in the, that one line in particular. You get, obviously, the tags is an accessor method. Um, but you also get this nested arbitrarily um, A lot of the times when you're looking at these APIs, you get maybe pet has its own class, but tags is probably just um, a array of hashes. Um, so you'd have to do like tags. Um, uh, that, which is a lot more cumbersome, this still works. But Accesses are convenient. You also get um, the quality comparison. Um, I'm going to compare this pet against pet retrieved by a, by a different method. You would call this pet was retrieved using the get pets by status. Um, this is the get pet by ID operation, which is um, down here in the uh, method. And uh, you can see the same pet once retrieved. You get, uh, I've shown the readers, you get uh, Writers as well. So that, that name to my username, the, so I've shown you class level methods for the operations, but you can also get instance level methods. So dot update pet is the the put method here, the crud update operation, and it takes a full, request, a full pet in the body, but since we have this pet instantiated as, uh, as a response already containing the pet, we just did update that. Same as here to save an active record and it updates it. Uh, we can check that it actually saved on the API by uh, running the get operation again and checking that the name is in fact even. So that update worked. Um, Scorpio has really good error handling built in as well. Uh, it maps HTTP errors to appropriate classes and gives you helpful messages. So zero is not about bad idea. So this is going to raise an error, which is not bad for a full error. It gives you the response body. Um, um, also here on the go off screen for a second, um, show the instantiation of even error responses as their appropriate schemas. I'm not sure that the specification uh, gives them. Uh, we'll try that. So this is the We have access to the underlying error. Uh, so we have showed off the configuration, the column to operations, the instantiation of the response body, and 
class and instance level operation methods and access methods. Okay, so a lot of the tools that exist in Ruby and other languages use generated code. Um, for example, if you go to Swagger.io and tool Swagger code gen, there's a Ruby thing here which will take your open API document and spit out generated Ruby files. You can download a zip file here of all the generated classes and methods. I don't like that. Scorpio uses no generated code. It's all uh, dynamically defined at uh, load time from your open API document because generated code is not maintainable. Every time you regenerate it, you have you either have to overwrite all the any customization you do, or you just never overwrite it and you never keep up with new features that come out. So um, all of the code loops in Scorpio because the open API document is basically code. And um, this isn't an exaggeration. An open API document is complex. It's a powerful specification, but expressing your API both accurately and maintainably, meaning without you know repetition and copy pasting schemas, it takes a significant amount of work and it's comparable to actually implementing an API client in Ruby. But you get a lot of advantages of implementing coding, encoding your API in open API over Ruby, which is, you know, a great tool ecosystem in the existing open API community between Swagger and all the other projects and all the languages that use this. Um, you also get uh, validation, uh, which most API clients won't have because the open API document gives schemas which should you have what types everything is expected to be. Um, it also enumerates expected response statuses, content types, like I said, everything about an API that you can think of to describe what's in your API document. Um, and apart from that, I, I'm biased obviously, but I think the interface that Scorpio gives you to work with an API is better than most of what's out there custom API clients that I've used, even well-featured ones, the Braintree has quite a good um, API client, which is hand-coded, and I don't think it uses any other major libraries to represent the resources of Braintree, but yeah. I've made comparable clients in an API with a few lines of code, and I'm biased. Um, if you take the time to express your API as no API document, the benefits are enormous. And I think that Scorpio is uh, poised to be a major um, benefit to anyone in the Ruby community who consumes web services. Um, that's pretty much all I have of credits. Um, the authors and maintainers of OpenAI mostly exist without that. JSON schema is the way you describe the schemas that I mentioned, which long predates OpenAI and is a really powerful and flexible way to describe uh, data structures. Uh, this presentation template is from the slides in our well. uh, There's a lot more credit to you. So that's what I have. Um, questions? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> would you, how do you use Scope Scorpio? Would you use that when you're writing a wrapper around another API? I mean, if it's so thin, you wouldn't even need to. Like, what's been your experience been there? I mean, so you use Scorpio when you're creating client interface to an API, but I mean, this all uses Scorpio 
mostly under the hood of the grand view structure initialize that you inherit from Scorpio's resource base, which is where most of the functionality that you interact with uh, comes from, both you know, actual, actual methods that are directly defined there, but more than that, dynamically defined methods that come from the OpenAI document. Yeah, so the what I was just thinking about open API, getting the open API document. So I mean I know that like yeah. certain services like like I don't need to do create API application basis. You can export that open API file and use another other is it easy? Are there a lot of things that where you can export this open API? Or if it's not there, like is it really cumbersome to document someone else's API and open API or any wrapper that they don't have it? Yeah. So next question is um Jen, the creation of the open API is kind of beyond the scope of Scorpio, but I do have significant experience with that. Um, for my own services, I write open API mostly by hand, um, but there is a Rails library that I think will try and generate at least the beginnings of an open API document from your routes and controllers, but there isn't quite enough metadata there to get all of the information that makes open API really powerful. Like, I don't think you would get much more of schemas from that. Um, possibly not all of your request and response content objects, uh, but status codes or running code in operation. That's kind of, um, that's generally the code and content. Um, I started working a little bit on middleware that like to put service interactions between the client and server and either creates or updates and improves an open API document using those, but they're a long way from um, releasable. Very happy so far. Um, you asked about how it was to write your own open API document describing someone else's service, which I've done twice now, sort of. One of them, I generated an open API document from a Waddle, um, uh, existing Waddle thing. I don't remember what that stands for. Uh, what is it? It's, it's something like kind of, yeah. Yeah. So if you have, if you or the open API, if the API that you are consuming has this, you can generate at least a start of an open API document from Waddle. Um, I've written one by hand just using documentation. It really comes down to how well the service that you're consuming is documented. If it has really good documentation, then taking that and mapping that into open API is time consuming a little bit, but straightforward. If it's not documented well, as a lot of them aren't, then I mean, that's always going to be hard to interface with no matter what. I have to make that some exception. Questions? So, what are the alternatives to the API? Um, Google's API discovery service may have been kind of a predecessor to that. So Google uses their own uh, format that they developed in-house to document their dozens, probably hundreds of APIs, and this is the Google REST description. Let see it here. Um, I used this a while ago, maybe five years ago, to work on a conceptually kind of similar client um, based on fork from actually Google's own API uh, clients in Ruby, but it wasn't very good. And Google's uh, API description was a really good start, but OK, yeah, it was better. Every way I can think of the one where Google's specification explicitly 
says what a resource is, whereas um, in OpenAPI, there isn't a direct concept of a resource. You have the tags and the schemas, which you kind of combine together. And what I use in Scorpio to represent a resource, but and it works really well. Um, but it's not a part of the specification itself. I'm not aware of other competitors. I have never used GraphQL myself, so I don't actually know enough about it to, to say much on that. Um, I've been really into like instead of well, all of GraphQL, uh, JSON API, which has some overlap with the goals of the API. But you <coughs> in ways that should be more so compatible and some other projects, but there's always a lot of features to the ones and so on. Yeah. When you um, initialize your resource, you pass it in a URL. Yeah. So you know, is that normal to use an external no. URL? Normally you're downloading. No, that's not how you would normally want to do this. I mean, if you have you know, an application that is consuming some web API, you would want to um, probably have the open API document that you're consuming in your repository just because you know network dependencies at load time are a problem. So yeah, that was just a quick and dirty way to get into IRB. Um, some of the gotchas I've run into in the past with REST APIs are where you start doing things like specifying, like only give me these certain fields or give me these nested resources but not these other ones. And is there any kind of like standard way to to specify that or to document that through Open API? Um, that's exactly the problem with graphical services. <laughs> yeah. So the request schemas that you get from um, The request schemas that you get from the OpenAPI.Canon largely specify what fields are expected. So if you go to, for example, that box, let's say, put operation, the request body is specified by the request body section that we just have here. Um, Okay, so this is the same asking that the pet is going to So this would tell you the, you know, the pet consists of the field type and the name. And now you can specify whether, whether additional properties are allowed or properties are required. Um, JSON schema is a very flexible and good way to express what data structures should look like for all of, you know, request bodies and response bodies, but also um, query parameters, uh, headers, um, I forget where all of these, but you can specify to a really impressive level of detail exactly what this should look like, what the request and response should look like. So, one quick question. Um, how does it handle like pagination? Uh, that's a good question. I implemented that last week. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't think there's a way to do pagination on the pet store as an example, but uh, I have another open source thing. Uh, anyone ever uses Rootly? It is a payment uh, gateway. This is a client that I made at work. I made it open source because their API is public and there's nothing uh, private to my company anymore. Um, so, is that, a, okay, is that an extension on the What's that? Yeah, oh, that's 
Yeah, so the tree explorer for GitHub, Octotree. I had to learn that. That's cool. So this is the open API document that I wrote by hand for their API from their uh, web documentation. Uh, it's not you know, interesting, but this is uh, this is loading it, and this is the entirety of the client for this. Um, it's longer than the pet store because it has a lot more functionality, but in very much the same way, you load up the uh, open API. Document. Actually, it's not quite the same because uh, for reasons I won't get into. The pagination is down here. Uh, the speech resource method calls to Scorpio's uh, each page. Uh, so the first part of this, well, first uh, chronologically, but not in code, the first part is. I won't get centric with that. Um, but your question, there's an interface in Scorpio that lets you give it an initial request and a prop called next page, which I do here, which returns the next page in the pagination if there is one, and we'll iterate over those and yield either each page or each instance of the resource as you go over it. Um, there's also a part of OpenAPI that I haven't done. To get them started on that, but OpenAPI has links which give you a response, can have links which refer to any other operation and um, let you. Oh, well, it says it better than I can. Um, let's see. So, in the response, we're using, we're using a creating user. The response to a one has a section called links, where you can get the user that you just created. It uh, specifies the operation, the user, and the parameters are dynamically evaluated from the response of the operation that you just ran, the create user operation here, and filled in on the request in the user ID parameter. And this is a really flexible way to link um, from any uh, call to an operation to any other operation. Or the same operation, in the case of pagination, the link will be the same operation with the query parameter for the next page. Uh, three is the newest 
release of OpenAPI, Scorpio supports both two and three. Um, 